The Travels of Marco Polo, Book 2, Chapter 12. The Oppressions of Ahmat and the Plot that was formed against him. You will hear further on about twelve persons appointed to dispose of lands, offices, and everything else at their discretion. Now one of these was a certain Saracen, a Persian Muslim, named Ahmat, a shrewd and able man who had more power and influence with the Great Khan than any of the others. The fact was, as came out after his death, that Ahmat, or Ahmad, was so wrought upon the Khan with his sorcery that the latter had the greatest faith in everything he said, and in this way did everything that Ahmad wished him to do. This person disposed of all appointments and offices, and passed sentence on all malefactors. Whenever he desired to have anyone, whom he hated, put to death, whether justly or not, he would go to the emperor and say, Such a one deserves death, for he has done this or that against your imperial dignity. Then the lord would say, Do as you think right. And so he would have the man executed forthwith. When people saw how unbounded were his powers and the reliance placed by the emperor on everything he said, they did not venture to oppose him in anything. No one was so high in rank or power as to be free from dread of him. If anyone was accused by him to the emperor of a capital offense and desired to defend himself, he was unable to present testimony in his own defense, for no one would stand by him since no one dared to oppose Ahmad. And thus the latter caused many to perish unjustly. Moreover, there was no beautiful woman whom he desired that he did not manage to possess, forcing her to be his wife if she was unmarried, or otherwise compelling her to yield to his desires. Whenever he learned of anyone who had a pretty daughter, certain ruffians of his would go to the father and say, What do you say? Here is this pretty daughter of yours. Give her in marriage to the bylo, that is, Lord Lieutenant, Ahmad, and we will arrange for him to give you such a post or office for three years. Thus tempted, the man would surrender his daughter. And Ahmad would go to the emperor and say, Such an office is vacant, or will be vacant on such a day, so and so is a good man for the post. And the emperor would reply, Do as you think best. And the father of the girl was immediately appointed to the government. Thus, either through the ambition of parents, or through fear of the minister, all the beautiful women were at his beck, either his wives or mistresses. Also, he had some twenty-five sons who held offices of importance, and some of these under the protection of their father's name, committed crimes like his own, and did many other evil deeds. This, Ahmad also had amassed a great fortune, for everybody who wanted office sent him a heavy bribe. In such authority did this man continue for twenty-two years. At last the people of the country, that is, the Cathayans, utterly wearied with the endless outrages and crimes he committed against either their wives or their own persons, conspired to slay him and revolt against the government. Among the rest there was a certain Cathayan named Cheenhu, a commander of a thousand whose mother, daughter, and wife had all been violated by the minister. Now this man, full of bitter resentment, began to plot the destruction of the minister with another Cathayan whose name was Wanhu, a commander of 10,000. They came to the conclusion that the time to do the deed would be during the Great Khan's absence from Khan Balik, for after stopping there three months, he used to go to Shangtu and stay three months, and at the same time his son Chinkim used to go away to his usual haunts, leaving Ahmad in charge of the city and in a position to obtain the Khan's orders from Shangtu when any emergency arose. Having come to this conclusion, the two plotters imparted it, to some leading Cathayans, and then, by common consent, sent word to their friends in many other cities that they had determined on such a day, at the signal given by a beacon, to massacre all men with beards, and that the other city should stand ready to do the same. The reason they spoke of massacring bearded men was that the Cathayans naturally have no beards, while beards are worn by the Tartars, Saracens, and Christians. And it should be known that all the Cathayans detested the Great Khan's rule, because he set over them governors who were Tartars or, more frequently, Saracens, and these they could not endure, for they were treated by them just like the slaves. You see, the Great Khan had not succeeded to the dominion of Cathay by hereditary right, but held it by conquest, and thus having no confidence in the natives, he put all authority into the hands of Tartars, Saracens, or Christians who were attached to his household and devoted to his service, and were foreigners in Cathay. Therefore, on the day appointed, the aforesaid Wanhu and Cheenu, having entered the palace at night, Wanhu sat down and caused a number of lights to be kindled before him. He then sent a messenger to Ahmat, who lived in the old city, as if to summon him to the presence of Chinkim, the Great Khan's son, who it was pretended had arrived unexpectedly. When Ahmat heard this, he was much surprised, but made haste to go, for he feared the prince greatly. When he arrived at the gate, he met a Tartar called Kogatai, who was captain of the Twelve Thousand that formed the standing garrison of the city. The latter asked him whether he was bound so late. To Chinkim, who was just arrived, said Kogatai, how can that be? How could he come so secretly that I was not aware of it? So he followed the minister with a number of his soldiers. Now the plan of the Cathayans was that if they could make an end of Ahmat, they would have naught else to be afraid of. So as soon as Ahmat got inside the palace and saw all the lights, he bowed down before Wanhu, supposing him to be Chinkim, and Cheenu, who was standing ready with a sword straight away, cut his head off. As soon as Kogatai, the Tartar captain who had halted at the entrance, saw this, he shouted, Treason, and instantly let fly an arrow at Wanhu, and shot him dead as he sat. 
At the same time, he called his people to seize Cheenu, and sent out a proclamation that anyone found in the streets would be instantly put to death. The Cathayans saw that the Tartars had discovered the plot, and that they had no longer any leader, since one was killed and the other seized. So they kept to their houses and were unable to pass the signal for the rising of the other cities, as had been agreed. Pogatai immediately dispatched messengers to the Great Khan, giving a full report of the whole affair, and the Khan sent back orders for him to make a careful investigation and to punish the guilty as they deserved. In the morning, Kogatai examined the Cathayans and put to death a number whom he found to be the ringleaders in this plot. The same was done in the other cities, when it was found that they too had been in the plot. After the Great Khan had returned to Khanbalik, he was very anxious to discover what had led to this affair. He then learned about all the endless outrages of the abominable Ahmad and his sons. He found that he and seven of his sons had forced no end of women to be their wives, besides those whom they had ravished. The Great Khan then ordered all the treasure that Ahmad had accumulated in the old city to be transferred to his treasury in the new city, and it was found to be an enormous amount. He also ordered the body of Ahmad to be dug up and cast into the streets for the dogs to tear, and commanded those of the sons who had followed the father's evil example to be flayed alive. These circumstances called the Khan's attention to the accursed doctrine of the Saracens, which excuse every crime, yea, even murder itself, when committed against any who are not of their religion. Seeing that this doctrine had led the vile Ahmad and his sons to act as they did without any sense of guilt, the Khan was led to entertain the greatest disgust and abhorrence for it. So he summoned the Saracens and prohibited their doing many things which their religion enjoined. Thus, he ordered them to regulate their marriages by the Tartar law, and prohibited their cutting the throats of animals that are killed for food, commanding them to slit the stomach in the Tartar way. Now, when all this happened, Messer Marco was on the scene. Chapter 13 of the Personal Guard of the Great Khan The bodyguard of the Great Khan consists of 12,000 horsemen who are termed Keshikten, which signifies soldiers devoted to their lord. It is not, however, out of fear that he is surrounded by this guard, but as a matter of state. These 12,000 men are commanded by four superior officers, each of whom is at the head of 3,000. And each 3,000 does constant duty in the palace during the three successive days and nights, at the end of which they are relieved by another division. When all the four have completed their period of duty, the first group takes its turn again. During the day, the 9,000 who are off guard do not quit the palace unless when employed in the service of his majesty, or when individuals are called away on urgent private business, in which case they must obtain leave. Chapter 14 of the style in which the Great Khan holds court. When His Majesty holds public court, those who attend it are seated in the following order. The table of the sovereign is placed above the others, and he takes his seat on the northern side with his face turned towards the south, and next to him on his left hand sits the Empress. On his right hand, upon seats somewhat lower, are placed his sons, grandsons, and other persons connected with him by blood, so that their heads are on a level with the Emperor's feet. The other princes and other nobility have their places at still lower tables, and the same rules are observed with respect to the females, the wives of the sons, grandsons, and other relatives of the Great Khan, being seated on the left hand, each lower than the preceding. Then follow the wives of the nobility and military officers, so that all are seated according to their respective ranks and dignities. The tables are arranged in such a manner that the great Khan on his elevated throne can overlook the whole. However, not all who assemble on such occasions can be accommodated at tables. The greater part of the officers, and even of the nobles, eat while sitting upon carpets, and on the outside stand a great multitude of persons, some of them petitioners who come from different countries and bring with them many rare and curious articles. In the middle of the hall, where the great Khan sits at a table, there is a magnificent piece of furniture in the form of a square coffer, each side of which is three paces in length, exquisitely carved with figures of animals and gilded. It is hollow and holds a golden vase of great capacity. On each of its four sides stands a smaller vessel containing about a hog's head, one of which is filled with mare's milk, another with the milk of the camel, and the others with the other kinds of beverage in use. Within this buffet are also all the vessels for serving the liquors to his majesty. Some of them are of beautiful gilt plate. Their size is such that when filled with wine or other liquor, the quantity would be sufficient for eight or ten men. Before every two persons at the tables, one of these flagons is placed, together with a kind of ladle in the form of a cup with a handle, also of plate. This is to be used not only for taking the wine out of the flagon, but for lifting it to the mouth. It is also done this way for the women. The quantity and richness of the plate belonging to his majesty, is quite incredible. Officers of rank are likewise appointed to see that all strangers who happen to arrive at the time of the festival, and are unacquainted with the etiquette of the court, are suitably accommodated with places. These stewards are continually moving about the hall, inquiring of the guests if there is anything they lack, or whether they want wine, milk, meat, or anything else, in which case it is immediately brought to them by the attendants. At each door of the Grand Hall, or of whatever part the Great Khan happens to be in, stand two gigantic men, one on each side, armed with staves to prevent persons from stepping on the threshold. If by chance anyone is guilty of this offense, these guards take his garment, which he must redeem by paying a fine. Or if they do not take the garment, they inflict on him a certain number of blows. But as strangers... 
may be unacquainted with the prohibition, officers are appointed to inform and warn them. All this is done because touching the threshold is regarded as a bad omen. As some of the company may be affected by the liquor, it is impossible to guard against the accident when they are leaving the hall, and the order is then not strictly enforced. The numerous persons who attend the sideboard of His Majesty and who serve him are all obligated to cover their noses and mouths with elegant veils or cloths of silk in order that his food or wine may not be affected by their breath. When drink is called for by him, and the page has presented it, he retires three paces and kneels down, whereupon all who are present also kneel down. At the same moment, all the musical instruments, of which there are a great many, begin to play, and continue to do so until he has ceased drinking, when all the company rise again. This salutation is made as often as His Majesty drinks. It is unnecessary to say anything of the victuals, because it may well be imagined how abundant they are. When the repast is finished and the tables have been removed, Various entertainers enter the hall, including comedians, performers on different instruments, tumblers, and jugglers who exhibit their skill in the presence of the Great Khan to the amusement and gratification of all the spectators. When these amusements are ended, the guests depart.